that's right. All right, we're all in. Morning, everyone. How are you going? We good. All right, well, we might kick off. Um, got a few people still jumping in. Thanks, everyone, for um, joining us for an hour. Um, my name is Jess Lai. I'm with Citrus Australia. Um, I've um, organised this information session. Um, Citrus Watch has been running a couple of years now and we've now we've starting to find our feet. So we thought it was an appropriate time to do an information session on the surveillance um, that we do. Uh, some of you may know that we submit a report, um, PHA organises that um, for the group um, that goes to SNFs um, most meetings as a meeting paper, which is a good way for people to get their heads around the kind of surveillance um, that we're doing and how we're doing it. But we thought that this is a good opportunity to start doing this information session with the view that we would do a couple of information sessions a year, just um, just to be more efficient in terms of how we're communicating what we're doing and um, so people can put faces to names as well so you, you know what we do, who we are, and um, if you want to reach out to us, then, then you can. Um, so I'll just ask everyone to mute their microphones while we're doing the, um, the session and we've got some question time um, allowed at the end of the session as well. Um, so I might just um, go ahead and hand over to Rowan, our project lead, to introduce the program. Okay, thank you. Um, Jess, have you got control of the shifting slides? I do. Yep, cool. All right, um, so my name's Rowan Burgess. I think you probably know most people online. Um, so originally Sharon Taylor was sort of the lead on this project and I've sort of taken over as she's switched roles a little bit internally. Um, so as Jess said, this project's been going for probably coming up to two years, maybe a little bit over. Um, and it's funded through Hort Innovation um, for the most part via um, the Citrus R&D levies. Um, and yeah, so that's probably that slide. There's also some parts of it that are supported through uh, the Citrus Australia PHA levy. Um, and I'll get onto that in a little bit as well. Um, can we go to the next slide, please, Jess? Um, so this project, as we said, is uh, the PHA is sort of the lead in it, um, but we've got strong partnerships with Citrus Australia, um, Northern Territory Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade, and Caesar Australia. And we're all sort of doing different components of the project. Um, and if we just flick to the next slide, and this is sort of a two minute, summary of the whole project so bear with us um so the the project yeah so i just make a note that we're we're recording at the moment um just so everyone's aware um so in terms of uh, project objectives for the the overarching project um citrus watch is aiming to basically develop a surveillance program for targeting exotic pests to citrus um it's also got a an element of preparedness for pest incursions going on through a number of bits of um, project activities. Um, there's also a, a strong focus on raising awareness of exotic pests and diseases um, amongst both the industry and community sectors. Um, and that's all feeding back into the promotion of, you know, reporting unusual pests and that sort of thing. Um, we're also looking at updating the biosecurity plan, which obviously helps inform where to focus our sort of attention on exotic pests. Um, and there's also a risk modelling component of the, the project as well that Caesar's helping us out with. So if we just flick to the next slide. Um, I think Citrus Australia's not come up there in the middle. Is there another, it might have an animation there if you can just, there we go. Sorry about that. Um, so in terms of an overview of the project components, as I said, the, there's four partners. So PHA's role is the, the lead coordination type position. Um, we're also working on a biosecurity plan review. So the last biosecurity plan was developed in about 2015. Um, probably not a lot has changed significantly in that time, but it's it's always good to to refresh and get a, a more accurate idea of how things sit in terms of our exotic pest threats. 
Um, the biosecurity plan also has a focus on some of the biosecurity activities we can do going forwards, and that's aligned with an industry developed surveillance strategy, um, biosecurity strategy. Um, PHA is also working on a, a number of host lists where we've tried to, to look at the different types of host. So primary hosts versus like true hosts versus um, conditional hosts that might be something that's used to vector a pest but not necessarily allowed the completion of the life cycle. So we're, we're investigating that in these host lists that we're developing. And we're also looking at developing some surveillance protocols um, aligned with the National Surveillance Protocol Standards, um, which is a fairly recent thing that's just gone through sniffs in the last oh, six months or so. Um, so that's sort of PHA's part of the project. Um, Citrus Australia um, is mostly responsible for surveillance in Southern Australia. Um, where they're doing a lot of work on trapping, visual bud stick collection, um, with a focus on urban as well as some commercial areas. Um, there's also a significant awareness raising component that they're involved in. Um, so there's a whole communications plan and stuff like that that um, Jess, I believe, will have a bit of a chat about later on. Um, there's also um, an urban coordinator, which is Andy Wong, who's here today who's got a, a focus on engaging in the urban space and obviously it's a high risk area for um, pests entering the country. Um, the project also includes study tours, a PhD project looking at psyllid um, ecology, I suppose is the, the best way of summarising that. And there's something called the Citrus Pest and Disease Prevention Committee, um, which also acts as a steering committee for the project. Um, those um, last couple of dot points there with the asterisks are also semi-funded through the citrus levy um, that PHA looks after. Um, next we have the Northern Territory Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade, who's predominantly responsible for surveillance in Northern Australia. So that's sort of um, basically tropical areas of Queensland, WA and the whole of the NT. Um, and much like uh, Citrus Australia, the focus is on um, trapping and visual surveillance type activities in urban as well as commercial activities. And they're making a fair effort of trying to get to as many of the, the commercial growers up there as they can, because obviously there's a, a reasonable risk pathway there from um, things entering from the north. Um, and much like Southern Australia, there's also a focus on awareness raising um, amongst community groups and that sort of thing. And there's strong linkages between, you know, Citrus Australia and NT government um, and hold regular meetings and catch-ups and make sure that we're all singing from the same hymn sheet. Um, and then finally, we've got Caesar Australia, who are responsible for a lot of the modelling work that's going to be going on. Um, and the idea of the modelling is that it's looking at where psyllids and other um, HPPs are likely to enter and establish in Australia. And the, the outcomes of that modelling can help guide where to, to better focus our surveillance activities going forwards. So I think that's pretty much um, in a nutshell as much as I wanted to go over it, and I'll um, refer that's back cool. to everyone else to, to proceed with things. So thank Great. you. Thanks a lot, Rowan, for the overview. Um, so as Rowan mentioned, there are quite a few um, aspects to the Citrus Watch program, um, which includes a few um, smaller um, add-on projects as well. Um, so there's a lot of education that goes on through the program and we're looking at ways of how we can do that better um, too. For the purpose of today, we're just going to focus on surveillance. Um, Andy and Ben will touch a little bit on the engagement that's been done um, around the surveillance activities. Um, and we're more than happy to do more of these information sessions if um, anyone wants to learn a little more about the other activities going on in the program as well. I'm just I'm going to drill down further into the surveillance activities and provide an overview of those. One thing I wanted to just point out to everyone for those not aware is we've recently um, over the last six months been working on and um, have released a citrus industry biosecurity strategy. Um, so that's the first time we've had a strategy for the industry that's solely focused on biosecurity. Before that, um, biosecurity um, priorities have been integrated in larger strategies for the industry. So this is really good. Um, so we've been able to set a vision um, for the industry and we have these different um, four different priority areas to focus on over the next five years. Data and information, education and upskilling, business resilience and response preparedness and communication and collaboration. 
And there are some activities within the strategy um, that um, focus on um, surveillance activities um, for the purpose of early detection of um, key exotic species. So this strategy and the activities um, in them and, and in the implement implementation plan that we've developed to sit under the strategy sit side by side um, really neatly with the biosecurity plan um, that's being updated by PHA um, as well. So um, what we're really going to be focusing on today for the rest of the um, webinar is um, how we conduct surveillance um, in urban and, and production regions within Citrus Watch and how we're going about um, um, through that, those surveillance activities raising awareness among particularly urban residents. Um, we also do that with citrus growers as well, but um, it's not the um, necessarily the focus of um, what we're talking about today. So um, I won't go through um, this schematic because Rowan has given you a really good overview already. I will just say that um, the program is you could really section it up into three main parts, surveillance, education and training and preparedness work. And we're focusing on the surveillance today. So we do our surveillance in Citrus Watch um, in using two different um, surveillance types or surveillance methods. Um, both uh, types of surveillance that we do are um, focusing on um, early detection, as I said. And the first one is um, what we call the Citrus Watch Early Detector Network, which is um, a, a network which is volunteer-based. So organisations and individuals from across Australia have put their hands up um, to say that they're happy to take um, the Asian citrus psyllid sticky trap um, twice a year. So in, um, in spring and autumn, we send out these sticky trapping kits and they take those traps and they place them in their backyard citrus tree, um, or it might be at a school, at a university, might be at a botanical garden. Um, we have quite a few different organisations on board, which Ben and um, Andy and will talk about further. Um, and through the sticky trapping network, we um, are able to do early detection surveillance for three main insect species, African citrus psyllid, Asian citrus psyllid. Um, so these two species are notable as being um, vectors for um, pathogens that cause um, two different kinds of citrus greening or Huang Long Bing disease, and also the glassy wing sharpshooter, which I'm sure um, you all know is a, a strong vector of Xylella fastidiosa. So the way we run the early detector network, we um, we split activities between um, NT government up north, um, who organise uh, coordinate activities for Northern Australia, and um, Citrus Australia, as Rowan mentioned, coordinate sticky trapping activities for Southern Australia. And we've got uh, targets um, each year. So CA um, Citrus Australia has a target of sending out um, 600 sticky traps per year and NT government has a target of 400 sticky traps per year. So how does it work? Um, our volunteers opt in through our online opt-in forms, and those forms have information about why there's, why we um, are asking them to put out sticky traps, what we're looking for, um, how their data is used, and how their um, data will be stored as well. Um, they allocate how many sticky traps they'd like to receive on an annual basis. We then send them a trapping kit, um, which has, as you can see here, sticky trap panels, um, Asian citrus psyllid attractant lures, um, cages for the sticky traps um, and twist ties, and also a package um, pack of um, information materials about the program. So they get trapping instructions, but we also send them out other program materials. We might send them out education materials with that. And we usually send them out a little gift every time we send out a trapping kit, like a hat or a notepad or pins or things like that. They then deploy um, the sticky trap um, and um, what they will do is then put in a MyPest guide report um, using the MyPest Guide Reporter app in our Citrus Watch um, MyPest Guide Reporter um, program. Um, and then they'll collect the sticky trap after two weeks, put them in mail bags that we give them, and those sticky traps go to field in entomologists who we work with who then um, go through the sticky traps and triage out any um, psyllids um, or sharpshooters that look suspect. At the moment, we've only ever taken out um, sticky traps for further analysis with um, triosid psyllids on them. 
because Australia does have quite a number of triozid, uh, native triozid species. So they can be um, confused with African citrus psyllids. So this has been a really good learning experience for us so far as to um, those other triozid species that we have out in the field that could be um, confused with African citrus psyllid. Um, if there is a suspect um, psyllid, we then will send that um, the sticky trap panels or photos, whatever is requested, to the um, the DPI that um, the sticky trap has been um, placed out in um, in that particular jurisdiction. Um, and then once we get all of the reports from my pest guide and the diagnostic reports from the entomologist, we will collate all of that data into um, master spreadsheets and upload the data to Auspicecheck. So I just want to touch on briefly because I don't want to go too far over time. Um, the other thing that we do in Citrus Watch is um, targeted surveys several times a year. So these surveys are carried out by um, Citrus Australia, we do targeted surveys across Southern Australia and we try and focus on those urban and peri-urban regions in Southern Australia um, and NT um, government um, undertakes their own targeted surveys across Northern Australia. Um, ben will tell you about the targeted surveys that he's conducted um, while he's been with Citrus Watch. I'm going to give you a, a bit of a, um, a quick briefing on what Citrus Australia has done in Southern Australia. But what um, these targeted surveys entail is we will go out in a team of twos or threes. Um, we go out on a multi-day survey. So usually we spend two or three days out in the field in a particular region. Um, we will do visual um, uh, sampling or, or visual inspection of trees according to our field protocol. We'll do a tap sample um, for insects and to see what, um, what falls out of the tree. Um, screening for exotic citrus psyllids and sharpshooters. And then we'll do bud stick collections from a subsample of trees. Um, and these bud sticks are then um, mailed to EMAI, the Citrus Pathology Group, um, run by um, Dr. Nerida Donovan. Um, and that group then tests for a range of, of pathogens um, for us, so including xylella and three different species of Candidatus liberibacter, um, Africanus, Asiaticus, and Americanus. That's just a little video of taking a bud stick sample ready to be sent off. So targeted surveys in Southern Australia have included a couple of surveys around Melbourne, so the CBD particularly near the port and also peri-urban um, areas around um, the Yarra Valley. So we have visited so far um, 20 sites across the Yarra Valley in inner, inner city Melbourne and these have included a variety of um, types of sites, so historic houses, we've been to waste, waste transfer stations to look at green waste piles, um, public gardens, um, school gardens as well, and um, and we've also looked at these kinds of sites in other regions such as Adelaide. We held a multi-day survey in May 2022. So we went and looked at 16 sites um, across Murray Bridge, um, Adelaide Hills and inner city Adelaide. In October 2022, we visited um, Sydney, um, which I'll speak about further in a minute. Um, we did a small survey around Perth um, earlier this year. And at the moment, we're looking at um, doing um, a survey in spring in Brisbane CBD or surrounds um, and the Swan Valley in w WA. So we'll be having some um, conversations with Rosalie and Michelle um, in, in WA to have a have a look at what sites we can we can go to there um, to best um, enhance what um, what the states are already doing. Um, just a little bit about the Sydney survey um, last October. So the way we structured that survey was we looked at three zones over three and a half days. Um, firstly, um, the zone in green, we had some sites that we um, identified around the Darling Harbour area. And then we had um, we looked at some sites around the Port Botany area in purple and then some sites around the Hawkesbury peri-urban area in red, which was um, a really good area to look at because there was a lot of new pick citrus orchards around there. Unfortunately, we wanted to do some more sites around the Hawkesbury region, but it was just after the floods and a lot of um, farm managers weren't able to host us on property at that time. And here's just some, um, some photos from that survey. 
So we went to a variety of sites, did a lot of tap sampling of Morea hedges, as you can see down the bottom here. There's a lot of them across Sydney. And we were joined for a couple of days um, by the citrus pathology team from New South Wales DPI as well. Um, uh, the Sydney survey gave us opportunity to test our new application um, that is just used by Citrus Australia for doing our surveys out in the field, which was really handy. It worked really well. This is an app that we had developed by AgConnect. Um, before this survey, we were uh, collecting everything in hard copy, which was a lot of work, as um, I'm sure you um, you all understand. So it was a great relief to have this application um, in action. And what it's allowed us to do is put polygons around um, all of our sites that we visited, note the locations of all the citrus or host trees that we find, um, and write, as you can see down here, site descriptions, number of trees that we found, the locations um, and descriptions of um, where to find them as well. So that's been a really great advancement for the program for Southern Australia um, and in Northern Australia, NT government have their own system of doing this as well, which I'm sure um, Ben will mention. Um, just to finish off, we've just been doing a lot of work um, developing um, uh, standards for our surveillance program to make sure that we're um, doing it right, um, collecting the data we need to collect in case that we do have a detection, we can do appropriate traceback um, to the um, to the survey, um, which it, something was found, or um, to the volunteer who put the sticky trap out. So we've been very busy doing that. Um, the first one of the first things we did was we actually um, we've probably done all of this very much out of order, but we created our field protocol um, when we're out in the field for our targeted surveys. How are we going to go about sampling the trees that we find? Um, how will we choose the trees that we decide to sample? Um, we also at that point developed program data standards. So I've just done a snippet of our data standards on the right there, just to make sure that we're collecting um, consistent data every time that we go out in the field. And we also um, design our early detected network with these data standards in mind. Um, we have data specifications for our program in OSPESTRIC. Um, those specifications are in draft or final draft mode at the moment. What we also have in draft at the moment is a national surveillance protocol for HLB, um, which PHA have been working on, um, which will um, sit on top of all of our other um, pro protocols um, and, and inform future developments for our surveillance program. Um, at the moment, the data that we have in OSPESTRIC is growing. We don't have all of our data in there. It's been quite a bit of work getting the data um, cleaned up and uploaded to OSPESTRIC, but at the moment we have about 1,400 occurrence records in our program. That's it from me. I'm actually going to hand over to Andy Wong now to tell you in more detail what we're doing with the early detector network in Southern Australia. Thanks, Jess. Um, sorry, I'm just going to be a bit annoying and just keep saying next. Um, yeah, thanks. So hi everyone, uh, I'm Andy. Um, some of you may know me, some of you may not, but uh, it's really good to see everyone here today. Um, so next, yep. Um, so at the beginning, the early detector network or EDN involved um, pilot activities that used volunteers for sticky trapping. Um, although uh, volunteers were from urban and peri-urban areas, um, a large number of sticky trapping volunteers were from regional or production areas. Um, as the project progressed, um, there was a realization that there should be an increase in awareness in cities, namely major port of entry cities. Um, I'll briefly explain this uh, a while later. Um, also worth noting that while designing um, surveillance activities based on risk of entry and establishment um, is crucial, um, we need to also consider the social context in urban landscapes that have the potential to increase or turbocharge general surveillance activities. Um, so this is where leveraging social capital in urban areas is also very important for our project. Um, next. Um, so quickly, this is just an illustration to show you the number of possible entry pathways of exotic pests into the country. Um, including entry through airports and seaports in major cities with high foot traffic. Um, other ways are via northerly winds and island hopping. Next. And based on this need to extend um, awareness in cities, um, this is where I came in. So I started my role as um, an urban biosecurity coordinator um, in July last year. 
And part of my role is to extend the early detector network volunteer base at key sites near ports of entry. Um, I also had to do a stakeholder mapping exercise before I was able to look at expanding our volunteers. Next. Uh, next. So where exactly are we conducting our surveillance when it comes to sticky trapping? Um, we know that Australia has five major production regions that are mostly located in southern Australia. Um, so the coordination of surveillance activities with growers in these regions are usually conducted by Jess. Um, my role involves coordinating surveillance in urban areas or major port of entry city cities, um, including Melbourne, um, Sydney, Perth, Brisbane and Adelaide. Next. So let's look at the improvements of EDN over time from 2021 to 2023. And before I dive into the maps and data stuff, um, let me just go through one of the exercises that I had to do before expanding the volunteer base. Um, some of you may already have seen this, but I'll just repeat this for the benefit of those who haven't. Um, when I first started this role, I mentioned that I'll be doing a stakeholder mapping exercise to first to assist in our program activities. Um, what I mean by this is um, who do we target to help with um, surveillance? So we can't get every single residential or urban gardener to help, but we can get key stakeholders within um, communities to assist us and hope that there'll be a trickle down effect. Um, to give you a better idea of what I mean, um, at a high level, stakeholders were identified based on their function, be it surveillance or engagement, um, their level of interest when it comes to biosecurity and plant health, and their level of influence or impact on urban communities. So um, the stakeholders are then prioritized as high or low. Um, so, for example, I've identified that community gardens can serve both um, surveillance and engagement functions and with a high level of interest and high influence or impact on urban or residential gardeners, um, this stakeholder group is prioritized as high. As a result, the stakeholder group is then targeted as an EDN volunteer. Um, so this is now complete, but as all projects go, um, the more you learn, um, the more tweaking or re-strategizing that needs to be done. Now, next. And so um, once the mapping exercise was completed, um, how did I um, expand this volunteer base? So firstly, I had to rely on the existing EDN uh, volunteer base. I then had to rely on the um, on Citrus Australia social media platforms um, for now. Um, can you click the thanks, Jess. Um, I also attended plant fairs and festivals and shared a booth with external project collaborators such as um, Agribusiness Yarra Valley and Urban Plant Health Network. Um, I've also attended um, other ways to expand a volunteer base is um, via other research project collaborations. Um, I've also had um, we've also had um, articles written in newsletters and magazines. And here I'd like to quickly acknowledge Ben Burchett from the NT government who will be presenting later. Um, so Ben got a contact from QDEF to promote our program um, in their e-newsletter. And from this um, initiative alone, um, we recruited uh, a very large number of volunteers from Brisbane. Um, and lastly, other ways to expand the volunteer base is by cold calling and or emailing. Next. So looking at the types of volunteers we have, um, our current EDN volunteers include residential gardeners, um, citrus orchards, community gardens, green waste transfer stations, zoos, schools and um, universities. Next. So um, now diving into some maps and data, um, we can see the change in the EDN volunteer base over time. So there has been an increase in volunteer numbers since autumn 2021. This is before I joined um, with now over 200 individuals and organizations across Australia. Um, there is now a broader geographic distribution of, of, of volunteers across Australia, and there's a greater number of volunteers located in major port of entry cities such as Brisbane, Sydney and Melbourne, giving the um, early detector network a strong presence in urban areas um, as well as production areas. Um, next. And um, the overall number of traps we've deployed and sent to diagnostics have also increased. So, for example, 44 in autumn 2021 versus 259 in spring 2022. 
Um, so the conversion rates have improved, which means that there's a greater chance of traps being deployed on receival, um, collected and mailed to entomologists. So we've recorded 38% in autumn 2021 versus 59% in spring 2022. Um, our quality of data is also improving, um, where we have coordinates, proper coordinates uh, recorded, um, appropriate ho host and site descriptions, and the use of the MyPest Guide Reporter app. Next. So looking at um, the current EDN um, for this just recent financial year. Um, so excluding production areas, um, we can see that there has been an increase in volunteer numbers in Brisbane and wider Queensland in autumn 2023, thanks to Ben and his contact. Um, so we had 57 volunteers in spring versus a whopping 156 volunteers in autumn. And um, of course, we can see that this number is skewed to Queensland, um, but and with some interest in regional um, areas. Next. And based on this update, our target number of traps to deploy each year is 600. However, as financial years have gone by, we can see a significant increase. So um, in 2021 to 2022 financial year, um, you can, we can see that 680 traps were deployed, um, uh, which shows 80 traps more than our target. And in the recent financial year, 845 traps were deployed with 245 traps more than the target. So there was a 24% increase from the previous um, uh, financial year to the current. Um, and if you look at the final EDN updates in spring 2022, um, so these are just um, snapshots from our EDN um, notifications that we sent out to our volunteers. Um, we deployed 434 traps um, in spring 2022, and in autumn 2023, we deployed 401 traps. Um, can you press next, please, Jess? Thank you. Um, so this shows a decrease in traps, but significant increase in volunteers as shown in previous slides. Um, so what does this mean? Um, it means we didn't have enough traps because we've gone way past our target, so we had to limit um, one trap per volunteer. Next. So looking at the challenges, highlights, and future plans, um, next. So the slide highlights both um, strategies and challenges. So what do we need to think about for the next financial year? Um, we know that volunteers are now skewed towards Brisbane and Melbourne. So we need more volunteers across Perth, um, Adelaide, and Sydney. Um, there should be more focus on other key stakeholders to get involved, um, for example, um, schools, um, because we know part of our program um, is to do with education and training. So um, the more engagement we can have with schools in terms of surveillance, the more engagement we can have with them um, for our um, education and training purposes. Um, so with significant increase in volunteers nationwide, um, based on the data that I, that I showed you guys and the maps, um, perhaps we need to consider budget and cost allocation for sticky traps because we've very well gone over our target. Um, and even if we remove regional volunteers, um, we may still go over our target. And we also need to think about international travelers who, actually, who live um, regionally. Next. So that's that. Um, when it comes to attracting and retaining volunteers, which also includes our future plans, um, we need to have more regular or succinct trapping season updates. Um, this this EDN update is uh, very wordy, um, my bad. Um, so that needs to be improved. Um, and then we need um, further improvements to our trapping guidelines. Um, we need to take into account um, literacy from both an education and cultural perspective. So for example, I met a, a lovely biosecurity officer from New South Wales DPI at the recent um, annual diagnostics and surveillance workshop. And he told me that his mom is one of our volunteers and um, his mom never quite finished high school. So when she received our trapping kit and had a look at the trapping guidelines, she didn't really know what to do. So um, he had to help her. Um, so perhaps um, we should include QR codes in our trapping guidelines that will link to videos. So um, 
as you can see in the top, Jess had um, created a how to trap video and it's on our Citrus Watch YouTube account. And perhaps we need a QR uh, code to link to this. Um, and if we're looking um, at also attracting um, people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities, um, perhaps we need videos that are translated. Um, also, other videos that we can consider um, creating, uh, you know, um, how to submit a report via my pest guide reporter app perhaps and have this also translated and have a QR code into trapping guidelines. Um, that's all uh, an, uh, an example. Um, next. So other ways to improve. Um, so Jess has created an online training course. It's now on PHA's Bolt platform. Um, if you can click next, Jess, uh, again. So that information guide is part of that online training course that Jess had created. Um, we've also uh, are looking at um, launching our newsletter for our volunteers and the wider public. So that's just that newsletter is a draft template that I've put together. Um, we're looking to launch our newsletter um, three times a year. So I'm getting Ben, Jess and myself. We're writing um, articles for the newsletter. And um, I'm also thinking about poss possibly including a little comic section. Um, so yeah, so watch out for this. Um, Jess and I are, look are also looking to launch our um, Citrus Watch um, Instagram account, um, hopefully in August this year, um, we'll see. And next, so this is my last slide. Um, so I've recently created and illustrated two urban mascots. You've seen them around, um, left is zesty, the citrus and on the right is twist. Um, the idea behind this is that both mascots will be featured in all our engagement or education resources. Uh, I'm hoping that they'll be engaging, friendly and fun for the public, including our um, surveillance volunteers. Um, and speaking of educational resources, I'm looking to create educational campaigns focusing on topics surrounding citrus and biosecurity. So for example, the first campaign is um, that I'm working on is reporting exotic citrus pests and diseases with an emphasis on using my pest guide reporter app. Um, I've just finished the first fact sheet, um, as you can see on the right here, but I'll be creating a poster preceding this with simple in, il, um, illustrations on what is our program, why are we doing this, this program and how you can, and how the public can help, and then listing the six key citrus pests and targets. Um, this will then introduce a series of fact sheets that will follow um, on from the first. And other um, other things that I'll be working on within the campaigns would be um, articles, um, perhaps fitting in podcast episodes, um, webinars if we can, and more videos um, on our U Citrus Watch YouTube account. So yeah, and that's. The end of my presentation. It's just. Thanks, Andy. Ben, are you uh, are you online? Certainly am. Um, right. Thanks to Andy. That was a great presentation, and also thanks to Jess for uh, promoting the program as well. It's been. Um, I look. I joined the program as the Northern sort of surveillance coordinator. Uh, back in late October last year. Um, I worked for the Department of Industry, Tourism and Trade for the Northern Territory Government. who are in partnership with Citrus Australia in uh, promoting the program and um, basically getting the milestones achieved. So I'll just get you to flip to the next one. So what does commercial citrus look like in Northern Australia? Uh, essentially, that is a bit of a map out of the major growing areas. You can obviously see that Northern Australia is nowhere near as uh, prevalent in the industry as Southern Australia. However, more importantly, we are at the northern doorstep of a lot of these pests and diseases lying to our north. Uh, next. So we touched on the EDN and the sticky traps. This is a bit of a um, I guess an illustration of where I'm sticky trapping across Northern Australia. Um, being new to the program, I'm majorly sort of focused on the major growing areas, as well as the urban and peri-urban areas of uh, the major regional towns and cities across the North. So in terms of commercial versus residential, there's a bit of a pie chart in terms of the percentages of uh, commercial trappers to residential trappers. 
So first round for 23, we had uh, 123 sign up or 125 and 72 individual trappers. Sorry, next. So retrieval rates are a bit of a challenge. Uh, a lot of people want to get involved, particularly when you're sort of doing, I guess it's not cold calling, but you know, they see something in an article or they see an email, they go, what a great idea, I want to get involved. Um, not always uh, do you get those traps received. A lot of people go on holidays or what they, you know, they thought they may have had time and now they don't. And sometimes the traps that I do deploy are carried over to the next season. So in terms of retrieval targets of 200, I'm basically over my target now, a bit like Andy. Um, these results are a little bit old. I've got about 220 return now. So the retrieval rate has actually improved. Um, so yeah, it, that's really good to see. And a lot of those that haven't been, I'll just get you to move to the next one, Jess. So you can see a bit of a demographic split up there of who we're targeting. So I'm heavily going for commercial growers. The residential uh, uh, basically is a result of Facebook articles, e-newsletters, people hearing about the program from word of mouth. Um, I'm targeting in education and community gardens as well. And I'm also trying to sort of form synergies with other interstate DPIs or similar industry or departments. So we've got QDAF on board. They sort of regularly put a bit of promotion out for us. And that's, um, as Andy said, resulted in a lot of interest. Um, I'm working with DPIRD, uh, NARCs, uh, NT Farmers. Um, I'm also targeting nurseries as well. This will obviously be expanded over time. Now you can see here, these are the ones that aren't returned. And this is something I've got to work on. But again, the reasons are varied. Um, people, you know, may have been keen to start with and then they lost interest or that, you know, may mean that they just carried over till the next season. Government are really good. Um, get almost 100% success rate with them, similarly with nurseries. Commercial growers are, are on board, but they tend to want you to set the traps. So I get a good return rate there, obviously. I'm using um, a lot of, I'm forming synergy. So I'm using, say, for example, the NTD DPI. I'm using our plant biosecurity officers in each of our regional locations to assist me in getting traps out there and doing a little bit of networking for me. Um, similarly with DPIRD, I've got um, Tracy Vinicum over there who's you know meeting with growers and setting some traps on my behalf. Uh, as well as NT farmers. We'll just move to the next one. So the targeted surveys, you're all aware of what we do there from previous slides. My aim is to basically hit every commercial area once a year. There's probably about four to five main commercial regions in my remit. Um, but yeah, essentially we're collecting bud sticks and doing visual assessments and tap sampling for those six key pests and diseases. Uh, next. So where have I been across Northern Australia this year? So I've done uh, a bit of rural Darwin. I've been down to Catherine. Uh, Daly River have a, a very large commercial orchard down there of lemons. Uh, it says 10,500. They're putting in another 3,500 next year. Probably small bickies compared to some places in the Riverina and uh, Mareeba. Uh, Kalanara, you know, quite remote, but they do have a bit of a, you know, a footprint over there as well. So my aim was to get over there and exactly sort of form some relationships with Deep Herd and the growers. Uh, and that enabled me to sort of conduct some targeted surveys over there. And more recently, I've been over to Dimbula and um, conducted some survey there. Uh, next. So part of my stakeholder engagement strategy is hitting a lot of targets of, uh, I guess, shows, agricultural fairs, schools, other educational institutions and community gardens. So I did go over earlier this year to the Far North Queensland Regional Forum where I presented citrus surveillance in, surveillance in Northern Australia. I think that was well received and enabled a lot of networking opportunities um, provided a vehicle for the recruitment drive, 
enabled me to distribute fact sheets and educational material and do a demo on what's involved in setting up a sticky trap, as well as meeting uh, orchard owners um, across the tablelands. Uh, next. Sorry, next slide, Jess. Uh, more recently, I attended field days in Mareeba as well. I'm quite conscious that being based in Darwin, that you know the major growing area in my remit is the tableland. So I'm trying as much as possible to sort of in improve my footprint over there. Uh, and the field days in Mareeba were will provide an excellent opportunity to do that. Um, and I was able to do some targeted surveillance uh, work over there as well, which was great. Next slide. So I've created a bit of merchandise and um, the obligatory pens, stubby calls and stickers. I've had a banner made up so that when I do hit these shows and fairs, I've got something to work with and some talking points. Um, and I think, you know, it sort of draws people in and creates a bit of conversation, talking points and so forth. So, um, yeah, next slide. So in terms of uh, media, I'm working with NT Farmers. They've got a Facebook page. They have a Grow magazine. I'm working with my own department and their comms team to get some stuff out on their web pages and Facebook. So we're hitting the socials. QDAF have been a really great, um, a great resource to tap into, actually. I didn't realise, as Andy said, I think I created a monster there, but a uh, better too many than too few. Um, you know, we're looking at doing articles in the NT Rural Review. I've got Facebook posts in some of the community gardens in the far north. Um, so that's really pleasing to see that, you know, just cold calling people and cold, you know, emailing people is, um, has had some element of payoff, uh, but not 100%. And there's more work to be done there. Uh, next. So here we go. Grower versus urban distribution across Northern Australia. Again, you can see this illustrates that we are hitting the regions where you know the largest uh, citrus production is. Um, we probably need to expand a bit more into uh, Townsville, I suppose, um, and just really improve on the areas that we're currently um, engaged with. And next. I'm going to run through these really quickly. These is these are just really quick maps of the sort of distribution of sticky traps um, that we've put out um, according to OSPES check. So we've got Dale just previously. There's Catherine and moving on. And we've got Kununurra. Sorry, that's a double. Keep going. Alice Springs. Mareeba and Surrounds. So the way I've done this is essentially when I joined, I was sort of, you know, I guess on a bit of a steep learning curve, but we used the, the way I developed my early detection network was basically we obviously had citrus canker up here. So we had a lot of contacts and we knew what they were growing and we had a bit of profile on the on the industry up here, but also the tomato potato psyllid. Uh, we got a lot of LPs, um trapping for that psyllid um prior to this um thing coming online so we tapped into that volunteer base to basically you know improve or basically extend that to Cit citrus watch um future activities sorry i've got the i can't see that screen yeah uh. You can't see the future activities screen, Ben? No, sorry. I'll click back and forward, see if that clears it. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. How about now? That's great. Yeah, so next week I've got the Rural Academic Enrichment Challenge, which is essentially focused on high achievers at primary schools across the rural area. Um, I'm going to, I've, I've, I've been focusing a lot on um, commercial growing regions, and now that I've done quite a considerable amount in that space, I'm now looking at nurseries, community gardens, and more of the urban and peri-urban landscapes through June, July. Um, I want to get into, tap into NT Farmers, who 
have some really good people there that are working on engaging with non-English speaking commercial growers. Um, and I'm looking at possibly getting some uh, translated material in varying languages to suit that audience. Uh, I'll be liaising with CDU as well as JCU. We've started collecting native psyllids and I've sent the first batch of 25 samples or 25 vials of samples off to Jess last week. Um, and we continued networking with diagnostic knowledge across internal and external state stakeholders and prepping for the next trapping season. Uh, next one. There's a long list of people who uh, really need a pat on the back for helping us with this work. Um, not only the program organisers from Plant Health Australia and Citrus Australia, but also the varying uh, New South Wales DPI, we've got DPIRD, we've got all the various uh, entomologists and plant pathologists behind the scenes working, uh, everyone down to even the system administrators that, you know, are developing, you know, offline forms and Citrus Watch uh, specific forms for the program. Um, and uh, look, all our volunteers, the commercial growers themselves, uh, and yeah, the list goes on and on. So apologies if I haven't captured everyone in that. But that'd be it from me. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot, Ben. That was um, that was great and well timed, everyone. So we've got a couple of minutes for questions or comments from um, from everyone attending. I should mention we've um, recorded the session, so if you have any colleagues who couldn't make it and are interested, let me know. I can send the video to them. Antoinette. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you. That was awesome. Really great overview of the project. You guys are doing some great work, really comprehensive, so well done. Um, just a question. Had you thought about incentivising return rates for your sticky mats, so trying to yeah, give them a, a reason to send it back? We haven't tried it yet, yeah. unless, Ben, if, I don't know if you've tried it, um, but no, Andy and I haven't gone down, down that road yet. You mean sort of incentivising with a, um, a gift or yeah, like a prize draw like or something? Yeah, we yep, haven't gone yep. down that road. Interesting no. concept. Yeah, Did look, you... I, I've, I have started. Um, sorry, Ben here. Mm. Um, I've just recently made up a bit of merch. Um, definitely those commercial growers I'm targeting and giving them a few rewards. And I intend to basically, when I send out a trap kit, I'll send out a pen and a couple of stickers. Um, and if they return it, then I'll be looking at, you know, something to reward them as well. We keep engaged. Um, I email each participant probably at least three times over the trapping, um, I guess, event, um, saying thanks for signing up. Your trap's in the mail. You know, if they haven't returned it, hey, it might be time to check it. Uh, when they do return it, I'll say thanks for returning it. And then when I get the results back, I can send them a quick email and say, Look, this is what we found. And here's a link to register again. Yep. And Andy? Yes, yeah, so following from Ben, thanks for that, Ben. Um, yeah, what Jess and I do is we we think about what are the new sort of collateral that we want to give our volunteers before we send the sticky traps out for the upcoming surveillance season. So um, like last trapping season, um, we, like Ben, we created um, new pens, notepads with illustrations of ACP and um, yeah, I we sent out caps as well. So I guess that's, that's some of the stuff that we give our volunteers, but um, yeah, but that's pre pre yeah. set up on yeah. the trap. Yeah, you need, you need the but carrot for the end. <laughs> yeah, and yeah, that's a really good point you raised because so far Jess and I we send out the notifications, right? And that's not really a reward, really. That's just an update. So, yeah, worth considering for the next surveillance season. Mm. Yeah. One thing we have it. discussed was um, it's not really a reward or incentive scheme, but 
we're trying to, if, when we go out to community gardens and talk to gardeners, Andy and I have noticed that the citrus trees are always pretty sick looking and they just want, they really want information on how to grow a good citrus and what they should be doing nutrition wise, things like that. So we've tossed around the idea of having special guest presenters at the end of the trapping mm -hmm. season, just as a bit of a thank you. Um, but in terms of incentives, we haven't tried that yet. So we might have to have a think. Yeah. Um, Aaron? Thanks, Jess. I actually really like that idea that you just suggested there. I think often when we talk about incentives, we tend to jump to monetary incentives, but you're exactly right. Like growing a good citrus tree is absolutely the goal for lots of these community gardeners and offering them some free advice. Um, uh, it may well be just the kind of incentive that they're after. So I think that's a great idea. Um, one of the so Citrus Watch, as you mentioned before, obviously gets reported through to SNFs um, and we were having a conversation um uh, uh about your report at the last meeting and one of the questions that came up was about the bud sticks um when you send the bud sticks through to emai do you send those through with the leaves still attached yeah we clicked um four bud sticks per tree with um some leaf attached yeah perfect Thanks. So useful that, for xylella as well. <laughs> yeah, no, that was one of the things that came up. It was un, uh, just in conversation. It was like, oh, do the, do the bud sticks go through with the leaves on or the leaves off? Yeah, no, um, we don't. We don't strip them. Yeah, but if they're going through with the leaves on, then they'll still have the PDL, and if they've still got the PDL, mm -hmm. they're still good for xylella. So mm -hmm. no, that's great. Thanks. For any other questions before we finish up? Well, I, in that case, um, thanks everyone for attending. Um, appreciate your time. I know everyone's always um, very busy, so you know where to find us if you have any questions or just want to have a chat, pick up the phone. Um, we're hoping to do another one of these sessions probably November, December. So, yeah, keep your eye out for that. Thanks all. Thanks, guys. Great work. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.